Anybody not ready? Okay, all right. Then I'll go with those who are ready. Hey, I want to continue this uh, summer sermon series that I started a couple of weeks ago called Better You. I just believe there's better in each and every one of us. And my hope is just to tap into that greatness that's inside of you and then unlock that greatness. Uh, because greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. So there's greatness inside of you because of Christ Jesus who lives in us, right? Two weeks ago, I talked about there's greatness in you because you were born for greatness. Psalms 139. We were fearfully and wonderfully made. He made us with purpose. He made us for a reason. He made us for a season. Last week, I talked to you about we may be dropped but not stopped. And we talked about Mephibosheth and Benjamin and, uh, and Jabez and how they unlock the greatness that was in them and maybe somebody has helped you unlock greatness or maybe you didn't have anybody you have to learn how to unlock it on your own we talked about that last week today i'm going to share a message with you simply called oh lord it's hard to be humble anybody remember that song huh anyway does anybody remember that song okay how many of you i don't have any clue what you're talking about yeah you have to go look at it. i haven't heard it in years and years and years but mac davis sang a song called oh lord it's hard to be humble uh when you're perfect in every way, that's right. Uh, or I could call this message, be humble or you'll stumble. Uh, either way, I'm going to talk to you about humility because it's a key to unlocking greatness in your life. Abraham Lincoln got into a, a situation with another politician who was trying to please this politician, so he made a decision to move some of his regiments to another place when he sent the orders to his Secretary of War, Edwin Stanton, who was not a big Lincoln fan, and Lincoln knew it, Edwin Stanton refused to carry out the orders and said, Lincoln is a fool. Well, word got back to Lincoln that Stanton had called him a fool, and Lincoln had a fabulous response. He said, well, if Stanton thinks I'm a fool, then I must be, because he's rarely wrong. Even having their differences, he recognized something inside of Stanton. And he said, let me find out for myself. So he spoke with Stanton himself and found out that the decision was a very bad decision. He withdrew his command. That's humility. Now I read of a sportscaster, great baseball great Ralph Kiner, who told how he had ended the season with 37 home runs, went to his manager of the Pittsburgh Pirates at the time and said, uh, he'd like a raise. The manager refused the raise. He said, why not? I led the league in home runs this year. He said, yeah, but what place did we come in? He said, well, we came in last place. He said, I can come in last place without you. That's called being humbled, right? Being humble. There's a difference in choosing humility and having humility chosen for you. Uh, I read of a young lady, young American uh, musician who had made her way over, a student who had made her way to Beethoven's museum in Germany and she was fascinated by the piano that Beethoven had composed many of his great pieces of work on and she asked the security guard there if she could play on a little bit and slipped him a lavish tip and he agreed she played a few bars of Moonlight Sonata and then walking out she said to the security guard she said I guess all the great pianists want to play on this piano right he shook his head no he said, most of the great pianists feel unworthy to touch it. See, now that's humility on part of the great pianist. It's being humbled on part of the little American student who wanted to play. See, God is attracted to humility. In fact, so much so that if you don't choose humility, he will allow humility to come upon you because he's attracted to humility. Jesus said that those who humble themselves like children are the greatest in the kingdom of God. So the greatness that's inside of you is linked to your humility. Someone once said, if I just had a little humility, then I'd be perfect. I think they missed the point. How many of you consider yourselves humble today? Don't raise your hand. <laughs> you would have failed the test. Don't. I'll just, I'll just stop you before you go there. In fact, is humility is a weird attitude to have to uh, process. Charles Spurgeon said this. He said, to be humble is to have a right estimate of ourselves. Don't think too high. Don't think too low. That's humility. Now, our culture gets it all backwards. 
most of the things that we're taught in the Gospels, most of the things we're taught in the Bible, is completely backward to the culture that we live in today. And that's why Proverbs 14, 12 says, there's a way that seems right to a man, but in the end it leads to death. And humility is mostly misunderstood because most people think that to be humble means that you uh, become a doormat, you give up all your rights, and it's a sign of weakness. It's the opposite of confidence. But I want to talk to you about this thing called humility because it is what unlocks greatness in your life. Mother Teresa said this, she said, if you're humble, nothing will touch you, neither praise nor disgrace, because you know what you are. See, humility is that fine balance between not thinking too much of yourself, not thinking too less of yourself. It's one of the most awesome qualities that any of us could possess. James 4, 6 says this, God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. How many could use a little grace in your life? Every one of us, right? You want that grace applied to your life, then you've got to be willing to step through the door of humility. But a lot of us are unwilling to step through the door of humility, and we miss out on the grace that God has for us. There's grace that he gives us when we're willing to walk through humility. In Matthew 23, 12, whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and whoever humbles himself will be exalted. So the, un, the way to unlock the greatness is by choosing to walk through the door of humility. Now, it doesn't feel good when you have to walk through that door. Eating humble pie is not good. It's not as good as the pies that we had at the Freedom Celebration. But when you choose humility, God has a way of adding a grace that exalts you and lifts you up to places you could never go on your own. So Jesus showed us what true humility looks like. One of my main purposes, every time I share with you what I feel like God is saying to us, is to show you how to walk it out, how to live it out, how to make it applicable to your life this week when you walk out of this room. So here's what the Bible tells us in Philippians chapter 2. If you've got your Bibles, you can turn there. On your phones, you can turn there. Or it'll be on the screen or on the Freedom Church app. Philippians chapter 2. Look at verses 3 through 11. Don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. Be humble, thinking of others as better than yourselves. Don't look out only for your own interests, but take an interest in others too. You must have the same attitude that Jesus had. Though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. And when he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on a cross. Therefore, therefore, what? What is therefore? I mean, because Jesus humbled himself, because he walked through the door of humility, because of that, God elevated him to the place of highest honor and gave him the name above all other names that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue declare that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. In other words, when Jesus walked through the door of humility, God raised him up and God will do the same thing for each and every one of us. It's much like giving. When you give, we don't give to get. That's not what we do. We give, but we know that when a seed is sown, God brings back a harvest, right? We recognize it. When you choose to walk through a door of humility, you don't do it just so you can get promotion. But when you choose to walk through the door of humility, God brings promotion. He exalts you. He elevates you in the same way that he elevated Christ. So what does humility look like? How do we walk it out? How, how do we clothe ourselves in this thing called humility? There's five things in this passage of scripture we just read. And I want to share with you real quick. Number one is this. Humility is unselfish. Unselfish. Don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. And just think of how many times we've made decisions, purchases, and done things just to impress somebody who doesn't even really care. How many of you ever, ever tried to impress somebody and you found out later that, that you were never on their radar to begin with? That's a humbling thought, right? Don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. In fact, the, the story of the Good Samaritan is a perfect example of this. Here's a Jewish man walking down the road. He gets robbed, beaten, and left to die. Well, a priest comes by. A priest doesn't help him. A Levite comes by. A Levite doesn't help him. Well, finally, a Samaritan comes by. Now, a Jewish man has nothing to do with the Samaritans. They would not associate with him. They would not be caught dead with them. But yet, here's a man laying there, and the Samaritan knows he's a Jewish man, 
But instead of walking on past him, he humbles himself. And he bandages his wounds. He pours in oil. He pours in wine. He puts him on his own donkey. He takes him into town. Puts him in an inn. Pays for his care. Even tells the innkeeper, if there's more expenses, I'll take care of it when I return. Just take care of this man. The Samaritan, the good Samaritan, humbled himself and helped somebody that didn't even like him. In other words, it was unexpected. And that's what humility looks like. It catches people off guard. When you choose to walk through the door of humility, it's not what's expected. I mean, it could be as simple as like a big burly biker getting off of his motorcycle and helping an elderly lady across the street. Not expected. Whoa, caught me off guard. That's what humility looks like. It could be a man in a suit get out of his car and helping somebody, a total stranger, push his car who's out of gas up to the gas station. It could be any number of things. It could be helping somebody clean up after a party, although it's going to make you later. Helping, helping somebody finish a project at work, even though you know it's going to put you in the middle of rush hour. Showing patience to a server at the restaurant because you get there and you recognize that there's more people, more customers than what the restaurant was prepared for. And they're understaffed. And you know this one person can't get around to everybody adequately. But yet you choose to show patience rather than making it all about you. You give a little grace. See, that's what humility looks like. It's unselfish. It doesn't think of you. It thinks of others. In fact, number two, humility considers others. Verse three said, be humble, thinking of others as better than yourselves. And now you don't have to go around and act like a martyr, but you have to consider others as better than yourselves. In fact, Jesus taught us that we ought to lay our lives down for another. Now, unless you serve in our nation's military or you're a skydiving instructor, you're probably not going to have to put your life on the line for somebody. So how does this apply to us? What does this look like today? What does it look like tomorrow? It means putting somebody's comfort and convenience ahead of yours. Because let's face it, until you're willing to do that, you're never going to be willing to lay your life down for somebody. So why don't we start with parking spots? Oh, no, he didn't go there, did he? Well, I'm glad my life's not dependent upon you showing some grace we can, you can't give up a parking spot much less lay your life down for somebody come on let's start with parking spots let's start let's start with letting somebody in the line in front of us let's start with holding the door with somebody knowing that when they go in ahead of you now they're in the line in front of you and they may get the next table and you may have to wait 20 more minutes oh don't act like you haven't ever thought about it now i know if i hold this door for that person now here, here. <laughs> Humility considers others. Just this last week, I took Bear, who is our executive pastor, and John, who is our youth pastor, out to lunch. And as we were going to lunch, you know, Bear outranks John, executive pastor, youth pastor, but you know what Bear did? Bear insisted that John sit in the front seat. John tried to, no, 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 I'll sit back here. No, he insisted. He said, it was a small thing. But you know what? It showed me an attitude of humility, considering others, caring about others. In fact, number three is this, humility cares about others. Verse four says, don't look out only for your own interest, but take an interest in others too. When we choose to do that, when we choose to bear one another's burdens, it makes everyone's burdens lighter. I know we're not encouraged and we're not inspired to really do this in our culture today. It's more about looking out for number one. It's more about, you know, taking care of yourself because if you don't take care of yourself, nobody else is going to. I remember reading the story that was uh, posted in the New York Times just a few years ago and about a, an NYPD officer by the name of Lawrence DePrimo. And he was on counterterrorism surveillance in Times Square. It was a cold winter night. As he was walking around, his feet were freezing. He had two pair of socks on, and he saw this homeless man walking with no shoes or socks. And he could see the blisters on his feet as he walked down 7th Avenue. Officer DePrimo disappeared for a few minutes and went into a Skechers, bought a pair of boots, came back and helped the man put them on and laced them up for him. It was an act that would have gone unnoticed had a tourist from Arizona not captured it on 
her phone and posted it on, on the NYPD's Facebook page. But he became an overnight sensation. 25 years old when he joined the force, still living at home with his parents in Long Island. When he was interviewed about this, he said he just saw somebody that was worse off than him. Somebody that had it worse than he did. And sometimes it's really easy for us to get callous to the needs that are around us, to the people that are around us. When they interviewed the store manager at Skechers, he said, yeah, it caught us all by surprise because we just get used to walking past these needs that are around us. And we all have the tendency to do that. So in order to walk out humility, sometimes you have to go against what your nature says that there'll always be another poor person. There'll always be another need. I can't meet every need, but maybe you can meet one need. It's like the person walking down the sands, the shore of the beach, throwing starfishes back in, and the shores are laced with thousands upon thousands of starfish, and somebody said, what difference do you think you're going to make? There are more starfishes than you could ever throw back into the sea. You say, well, I just made a difference to that one. You see, sometimes it's just about helping one person. Sometimes it's just about being there for one person. Humility cares about others. And number four, humility uses position and privilege for the benefit of others. Verse six says, though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Although Jesus Christ was equal with God, he didn't consider that as a position that he had to hold on to. He was willing to lay that aside in order to help somebody else. One version says being in nature God, he did not consider equality with God as something to be used to his own advantage. Sometimes we have a tendency to use the position and the privilege that we have for only our own advantage. You got to be willing to use it for somebody else. That's what humility does. It uses your position, it uses your privilege to help somebody else. There were two brothers who were always competing against each other, and the mom finally had had enough of it. I mean, they would even compete over, you know, how big of a piece of pie they got at dessert so she finally here's her answer her solution she cut one very large piece of pie put it before the two boys and let one cut the pie and the other one choose the piece well that seemed to work it solved the problem at least for dessert they became very good at cutting a perfectly even piece of pie but as the boys began to mature one of the boys came to mom and said mom do you have any other ideas on how to apply fairness to some of the other major decisions we have in life. She said, yes, I do. It's called the golden rule. It's called the golden rule. Just do unto others as you would have them do unto you. This, in simple terms, is humility. And here's the last thing, number five. Humility isn't just an attitude, it's an action. Humility isn't just something that we feel. It's not just something that we think. It's not just something internal. It's actually processed through an action. You got to be willing to walk it out. I read the story of a guy by the name of Gareth Griffith who was vacationing in Florida and decided to go skydiving. His tandem skydiving instructor was named Michael Costello everything seemed right everything went perfect until he jumped out of the plane and they pulled the rip cord and nothing happened so no problem we've got an emergency shoot a backup shoot but it failed as well they began to spiral out of control Michael Costello the skydiving instructor was able to stop their spiral they were falling as Gareth Griffith was on the bottom and he was on the top and as they were plunging toward the ground right at the last moment he wrapped his arm and his leg around Gareth Griffith and flipped to his back and took the brunt of that fall Gareth Griffith survived Michael Costello did not he gave his life for another in an act of humility 
he showed what it meant to lay down your life for someone else. You see, humility is an attitude in an action. And Jesus showed us this. Jesus showed us what it looked like in John chapter 13. He took, actually, he took his robe off. He set it down, which represented his position. A robe in those days was representative of a position. A position of royalty, a position of authority. When the prodigal son returned, the father rewarded him with a robe. He took his robe off, his position off, and he girded himself with a towel. He took a towel, and the towel in that day said he wrapped it around his waist. It would have wrapped all the way around his waist and then draped to the floor for him to be able to have to his side to be able to do what he was about to do next. And I'm going to ask my mother and my wife and my daughter if they would come and join me here on the platform. Because here's what Jesus did. Jesus showed his disciples what humility looked like as he recognized the greatness that was in them. Because what he did was he washed their feet and then he told them to do likewise. He told them to go out and do likewise. Was he telling them to go out and wash everybody's feet? No. He was showing them an example of the type of heart that we need to have for other people. And here's what I want to do in just these next few moments. I'm going to ask my mother, who represents the generation that has gone before. Mom, we wouldn't be here today had there not been a generation that paved the way. None of us would be here. Let's just make it us right here in this room today. We wouldn't be in this church. We wouldn't be in this building. We wouldn't have these facilities had it not been for a generation that went before and paved the way, who made the sacrifice, who had a vision and ran with the vision and made it possible for us to be here today. So for the generation that has gone before, I honor you. And mom, I honor you representing that generation. In humility, I humble myself before you and I recognize that the, the quality of life, the health of our church, that everything that we are today is because somebody paid a price. But I also recognize you as my mother. And it's almost unimaginable for me to think that I was conceived in your womb, spent nine years, I'm sorry, woo, uh, <laughs> nine months, that would have been terrible, nine months in your womb, you put your life on the line for me. You cared for me when I was crying and hungry and sick. You comforted me when I was needing comfort. You scolded me when I needed scolding put up with me through my rebellious years and you still pray for me today mom I recognize the greatness in you you didn't have to do that but you did and I'm so thankful I love you and I want to wash your feet today to recognize your impact in my life and that I'm here today because of you Starla, you represent today the people that we're doing life with right here, right now, our church body. And I'm so thankful that we have this church body to do life with, to reach our community with, to make an impact here in North Dallas with. We're not all perfect. Sometimes we get on each other's nerves as a church body. <laughs> but I'm thankful for the people that we do life with today. And I recognize 
you as the present group of people that God has called us to do life with. But I also recognize you as my wife, my partner, my soulmate, my best friend. We're not perfect. I'm a whole lot less not perfect than you. But we're better together. I'm better because of you. And in the same way as a church family, we're better because of each other. Thank you for putting up with me. Thank you for being patient with me. Thank you for forgiving me. Thank you for making me better than I could ever be on my own. In humility, I recognize your greatness. Being my present partner in this thing called life. And I wash your feet today in that honor. you're the next generation I recognize the greatness that's in you because God has chosen you for such a time as this and it's up to us to recognize that greatness and to unlock your greatness by being willing to pass on the baton to you we as a church I I recognize the greatness in our young people I recognize the greatness in our young adults in our children There's greatness in you, and you're going to do things that we could never do. You're going to accomplish things we could never accomplish. So I speak life into your calling and into your gifting as the next generation. Run well, run strong, run fast, because you're going to do things we've only dreamed of doing. But also recognize you as my daughter, my baby girl. I wasn't a perfect father put up with me but you know what you're serving Jesus today so that means you took this gospel you took this lesson you took this life that me and your mother passed on to you you chose Christ and I see that greatness in you because of the Christ that lives in you and I honor you because you made that choice to serve him you made the choice to live for Jesus. And I couldn't be more proud. So I recognize your greatness today and I wanna wash your feet because I know that you're gonna do things that me and your mother have only dreamed of. And I'm excited to see you accomplish those things. Every single one of us have people in our lives that have gone before, that have paved the way, people that we're doing life with right here and right now, and people that we have to be willing to invest in in the future. We as a church have that, but you as individuals have that as well. And one way you will unlock the greatness in you is by recognizing the greatness in others. And when you recognize that and you speak life into the greatness that's in others around you, it will only allow God to promote you and elevate you where you need to be. Would you do me a favor and stand to your feet all over this place? Stand to your feet and come on, do me a favor and just sing it out. Here I am to worship. Here I am to bow down. He's worthy of our praise this morning. Come on, sing it to him. Here I am to worship. Here I am.
The only way for you to step into the greatness that God has in store for you is to humble yourself and surrender yourself to Christ. Because greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. In order to have that greatness in you, you must be surrendered to Christ. It takes an act of humility to do that. Maybe you're here today and you've never accepted Christ, or maybe you have before but you've walked away from your faith, but this is a moment where you're saying, you know what, I want to humble myself, surrender myself to my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I want to walk in that grace that God has for me, that power, knowing that you can only experience that connected to your Creator, connected to your God, connected to your Savior. You say, I want to walk in that today. All over this place, with your heads bowed, eyes closed, you hear you say, Kendall, that's me. I'm ready to humble myself, surrender myself to Christ. I want to choose to follow him today. I've not really been where I need to be with God, but today I'm ready to come home to Christ. On the count of three, I want you to lift up your hand. I want to know who I'm praying for. One, two, three. Say, that's me. Pray for me. Just pray for me. Amen. Thank you. Anybody else? Just say, that's me. That's me. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Just say, Pastor Kendall, pray for me. Just slip your hand up and you put it right back down. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Just say, Kendall, pray for me. God sees every single person and knows right where you are. And some of you may be drawing on you right now, calling on you. Say, Kendall, pray for me. Just slip your hand up and put it right back down. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, thank you. I want to pray. I'm going to ask everybody to pray this simple prayer with me. It may seem simple as we say it, but what makes it profound is whether you believe it or not. Because the Bible says if we confess with our mouth and believe in our heart that God has raised Christ from the dead, then anyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. As we confess with our mouth, believe this in your heart. Watch God take the old and make it new today. Everybody pray this with me so no one prays alone. Everyone say, Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for sending Jesus to die on the cross for me. Come into my heart. Wash away my sin. Be the Lord of my life today and every day. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Come on, now give him some praise, will you? Here I am. Come on. Here I am. Sing it out to me. Listen, if you made a decision to follow Christ today, here's what I want you to do. Before you walk out of this room, make your way right over to the I have decided wall to your left and my right. Sign your name on there. Just sign it, date it, declare it today. I decided to follow Jesus. It's a great expression of your decision to follow Christ today. We also have a, uh, a book we'd love to put in your hand called Now What? It'll help you with your next step in following Christ. Uh, make sure you pick that up on the way out or as you make your way out. And then I totally forgot again. So here's what I'm going to do. I, I forgot about our missions offering. <laughs> okay, here's what I'm going to do. Ushers, we stand at the back. Just stand at the back. Just take the bucket and stand at the back. Don't let anybody walk out until they put something in it. We can just fix it that way right now. Listen, I'm not going to hold you any longer. You know, there's many ways you can. Once a month, we do this for our missionaries. Once a month, we do something for others to make sure that our missionaries have what they need to continue to preach the gospel all around the world. So would you help us help our missionaries? You can text the word kingdom and the amount. Just if you take your phones out and text the word kingdom and 500 right now, watch how fast and easy it goes through. 500 goes through a whole lot faster than 100. No, whatever, whatever. No, really, whatever. I'm just messing with you. I appreciate everybody's commitment to our Kingdom Builders and Missions Program. It doesn't happen without you. And I don't want to minimize this, but I, I, I don't want to make you sit down and go through this all over again. 
uh, but we need our missionaries taken care of. So this is the way we do it. Once a month, we take up a special offering, and it meets all those needs. And 90, we have, we're up to 90 different missionaries or missions organi organizations that we support on a monthly basis. It's pretty amazing. And this one offering every month does that. So do it on your phones. Do it on your just you write a check, you can sit back down in a minute when we dismiss it. Write a check, you drop it in the bucket. The ushers will be at the doors on the way out. Thank you for your help. You guys are amazing. I love you guys. Walk in some humility and watch God unlock the greatness in you. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May his face shine upon you and give you great, great peace. I love you guys. Have a blessed week, everybody.